making inference through statistics education. And um, we have three speakers in this session who will talk for about 15 minutes each and then we'll hold off on questions until the end of all three speakers and then we'll have some question time and then after that we're going to move into some breakout rooms where you'll have an opportunity to have smaller group discussions with each of the speakers and you'll be able to move around <coughs> excuse me in the breakout rooms if you want to okay so the idea behind this session is that statistics education is often touted as a solution to problems with questionable research practices, statistical misconceptions, which we all know are very widespread and have demonstrated consequences for false positive rates in the literature, amongst other things. Um, we're, many of you are probably also aware that for decades, people have been talking about statistical reform and connecting that to discussions about statistics education. But in recent meta research or meta science discussions, I feel like statistics education has disappeared a little bit from the conversation, perhaps not received the attention it should have. So this session is um, you know, a, a step to trying to rectify that. So um, we're going to hear today from Professor Mick McCarthy, who is a quantitative ecologist, and will be examining problems with statistical presentations in textbooks. Bob Carlin Jagman will talk a, a, about developments in teaching an estimation approach to statistics, and Lee Jones will talk about statistical education focused on linear models and assumption misconceptions. Um, there are, of course, I think we all acknowledge that there are limits to what education alone can fix and that the, these will never be a replacement for other uh, institutional and structural reforms. But this session is focused on the benefits of improved statistics education. Um, I'm going to invite um, speakers in this order, Mick, Bob, and then Lee to finish. So I'll hand over now to Mick if you want to start sharing your screens. Remember that you can um, type your questions in the chat box as they occur to you and we'll get to them at the end of all the three talks. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks Fiona and welcome everyone. Um, um, it's morning for me on Wurundjeri land in Melbourne and I pay my respects to the elders past and present and to any First Nations people listening to this talk. I also extend that um, respect. Uh, this talk and the work that I'm, I'm reporting on isn't really about improving, it's really just highlighting the problems. I've got some ideas about improvement that I'll, I'll um, discuss at the end but if you have uh, thoughts about that, that would be really great uh, to get your input. It arose uh, when our, our, our school was looking at redesigning its biology curriculum and um, we were looking at different textbooks that could be used. I wasn't in, directly involved in that, but uh, I got to see one of the textbooks that was being proposed and the statistics in it were frankly appalling uh, and I raised concerns about that and one of my colleagues said, well, it's probably true in just about every other textbook. And I had two other biology textbooks on my on my desk, and one was good, and one was equally appalling as the first. And so I thought, well, maybe I really um, would be better off just reviewing as many of these biology textbooks as I could uh, to see how they're performing. Now, to be honest, I wasn't hopeful, and Fiona's talked a little bit about um, some of the problems that we know about. This is just one of those papers that discusses the problems of the use of statistics in the discipline. So I perhaps wouldn't be surprised to find problems in first year biology textbooks as well. And I think there's, there's two issues. One is that there's a history of flawed use of statistics in biology. Uh, and that revolves around mostly null hypothesis significance testing where power is ignored and p-values are misinterpreted. Also, the other reason I was probably not particularly hopeful is that there was a study done of, similar to what I'm going to be reporting here, of psychology textbooks, introductory psychology textbooks, 
And in approximately 90% of those, they, the authors defined or explained statistical significance incorrectly. And so they were presenting well-known fallacies as actually as if they were true. So what I did was I got access to 15 textbooks from four major publishers. Uh, these were in editions ranging from third to 15th edition. So they were mostly really quite well-established textbooks. Uh, 10 of them included statistical content in review questions or as stated as part of their list of learning objectives for the book. And so at least in those 10, statistics was being viewed or presented by the authors as being important within biology. There were a further four books that included statistical content and two of them had quite a lot of statistical content. So I'd say at least in 12 of these books, the authors were viewing statistics as being important in biology and it was mentioned in at least two others. So of those 17 books, 13 explained or defined statistical significance and or p-values. And, and when I say defined, then I'm talking about where they actually talk about setting up a null hypothesis, calculating a p-value as the probability of, observed, of uh, getting the observed data or more extreme data if the null hypothesis was true. It, when I say explained, there'll be things like science, uh, the statements will be things like scientists calculate the probability of dot, dot, dot. Uh, and they don't necessarily go into a full definition of what a p-value is. So what I was doing was just looking at the statistical content, and I'm going to talk more broadly about that, but I'm going to focus first on the null hypothesis significance testing. And so what I was doing was just categorizing the way that p-values or null hypothesis significance testing was uh, defined or explained in the books. And I was using Fiona's uh, catalog of errors that she had um, where she was uh, documenting errors in the interpretation of null hypothesis significance testing in the literature more broadly. And so the first one of these is, uh, of the errors, is that P is defined as the, or, or is reported as the probability that the null hypothesis is true. So this is the inverse um, probability fallacy. Uh, P uh, is sometimes incorrectly referred to as the complement of the probability of the alternative hypothesis being true. P is the probability that the results are due to chance, which I might come back to. P is an inverse indicator of effect size, is uh, the fourth error that's often uh, used, uh, often um, uh, uh, communicated. The fifth error is that P is the complement of the probability of replication. So a low P value means that, well, one minus that P value is the probability that the results will be replicated. Uh, the sixth error is uh, that statistical non-significance means that there's no effect or that uh, we can reject the alternative hypothesis of an effect. And the seventh error that Fiona identified was statistically significant results are necessarily theoretically important. Uh, I actually found a sixth, uh, an eighth error in these books, um, and that was that P is the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis when it is true. So this is just confusing the p-value with the alpha level. So how did these books do? Well, this is the distribution of the errors. So there was um, uh, a plethora of errors in these uh, textbooks. The most common error, which occurred in a bit over half of these 13 books, so seven out of the uh, 13 books uh, that defined or explained significance testing, referred to the p-value as the probability that the results were due to chance. Uh, just over 20% of these referred to uh, the p-value as the probability that the null is true. And then we had an array of other errors as well. Uh, this, this fourth error didn't actually turn up in those 13 books. So only one book did not describe significance testing erroneously out of the 13 that um, made an attempt to do that. Uh, so it's, I think, a major problem. And it's not surprising that when I talk to second year ecology students, I typically get the sense that they don't understand null hypothesis significance testing. Because even if they're trying and reading multiple books, at least in biology, 
they will be getting really confused because they don't actually get the correct um, definition provided to them and they get conflicting definitions that are incorrect provided to them. Uh, a few books actually tried to counter some of these fallacies. Uh, so there were two books uh, that actually did this and they both noted that non-significant um, differences does not mean that there's no effect and also uh, uh, those two books also said, uh, noted that significance does not mean that the result is important. One of those books actually said that when you talk, when you define or refer to results as being significant, it's really important that you define whether you mean importance or statistical significance. But then when you do a search on that book for significance with that throughout the book, you'll find that they do exactly that and refer to significance without being clear whether they mean importance or statistical significance. So while they tried, you know, counted the fallacy, um, they didn't actually uh, follow through with that in their own practice. So um, the absence of power is one of the other issues where um, there's problems with null hypothesis significance testing in the literature and only four books alluded to statistical power. They didn't actually even use the term statistical power, but they noted that the reliability of statistical tests depends on the true effect size, which occurred in one book, variation in the data that occurred in two books and sample size that occurred in two books. None of them noted that the power also depends on the, uh, the statistical test that's actually applied. So power is getting underrepresented and, and not really explained at all in most of these textbooks either. Uh, I also was interested in the degree to which confidence intervals are uh, uh, reported within the books and explained. Uh, so it's regarded as a useful way of um, uh, providing estimates of effect sizes can help if presented and interpreted well, can help avoid some of the fallacies that I've mentioned. Uh, and so it's often us usually more useful, particularly in biology, to be focusing on effect sizes rather than significance testing. And it's strongly recommended as a way of improving statistical practice in biology. So confidence intervals were described in one of the 17 books that I looked at. Uh, and in another, the, the authors suggested reading a stats book to get a um, better handle on it. Standard errors uh, were mentioned in eight of the books, explained in five, but in two of those five cases where they explained standard errors, they confused them with standard deviations of the data. So they wasn't particularly well done either. Uh, another two books mentioned error bars, but didn't uh, distinguish between whether they were confidence intervals with some um, percentile or standard errors. So again, this is one of the problems with presentation of statistics in biology is the error bars are often not uh, clearly defined in the literature as well. So there'll be lots of papers where the error bars will be presented and the authors don't actually tell you whether they're confidence intervals or standard errors or some other form of error. Just in terms of other statistical content, correlation was mentioned in 12 of the books, um, but only one book actually showed how to calculate it. Nine of those books noted that correlation does not equal causation. And in this case, at least, the authors sort of followed through with that. And I couldn't find anywhere else in the book where they interpreted correlation as causation. Uh, Five books referred to maximum likelihood estimation um, <clears throat> only around the <clears throat> only around the generation of phylogenetic trees, uh, so not more broadly in terms of estimation. Um, and Bayesian methods weren't mentioned in any of them either. So I've got a bit of a to-do list. One is to I've got another book that I've just become aware of, so I've got to examine that. Uh, and look for statistical content. It does have quite a lot, which is why I haven't had time to um, uh, analyze it um, uh, 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 in detail before now. Also, uh, we'll plan to um, contact the authors and offer advice about how to correct that. And that's one area where hopefully we can get some improvement if those authors are willing to sort of engage and, um, and make modifications to their textbooks to remove the errors. I also know that colleagues both within my own institution and more broadly within my discipline are confused about this and they teach students uh, errors themselves. So even if we corrected the textbooks, um, it's not really clear to me that we would do a great job of actually teaching students uh, how to interpret null hypothesis. 
significant testing appropriately. I'd like to thank the, the four publishers who provided me access to these books. They did so on a free basis. Um, some of them on the understanding that I was going to be trying to help their authors um, improve their textbooks and also Fiona uh, for some discussions about this as well. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Mick. I was just thinking actually that the, your to-do list would have made an excellent hackathon for this conference. I can imagine a little workshop where we sit around and write letters and advice to um, That'll that be would have, a, a yeah, that would have been great to... because that's the, I mean one of the things is just finding the time to write the appropriately crafted letter. Yeah, that's to each right. of these authors because you know it's important if it's going to actually make a difference. Getting that letter right is going to be important. Maybe it's something we can work on um, outside of this. But if you're interested in an activity like that, um, put it you know put your email address in the chat maybe and we can organise something. Um, and do put your questions in the chat as well, and we will get to them um, at the end of our set of three talks. So I think uh, Bob is up next, if you want to start sharing your screen. Bob's a... Um, no, you guys can just put me on um, speaker view or something. I, this okay. will less screens so, to juggle. Hi, everybody. Uh, hello from Chicago. Hello from November. If you're in Australia, you're living my future. I hope it's better than my current. And you're sending me some good times here in the next day when I get to December. Um, the presentation I'm going to show you uh, comes from me, but it also comes from a collaboration I've been working on for some time with uh, Jeff Cumming, um, who's lurking in here somewhere. Uh, Jeff and I have been working for the past couple of years on a statistics textbook, which we hope doesn't have some of these errors that Mick just mentioned. And I mentioned that not to sell textbooks, uh, but just so that you know that anything you don't like that I say is all Jeff's fault. Um, I have kind of a polemical presentation here. I want to be trying to be persuasive. I want to try to tell you, and I think this should be an easy sell in this Amos uh, attendees, that estimation that uh, is with open science is usually a better way of doing inference, better than the traditional hypothesis testing approach that dominates the social and life sciences right now. That when we train our students and our trainees, that we should be teaching them estimation first, to be fluent in estimation first, with our second language being testing. And that I want to share with you some tools that we think can make this transition in our training uh, pretty easy and painless. Um, so I'm going to just start by just making sure we're on the same page. I want to talk about what do I mean by this estimation approach. There are these kind of two longstanding traditions in statistical inference. The testing approach is what has been very dominant in some sciences. Um, and it's where we ask a qualitative question like, does this drug work? Does early childhood education impact IQ? And we answer that question by um, calculating a test statistic, a p-value, or if you're very fancy, maybe a Bayes factor. And those test statistics tell you something about the plausibility of a specific null hypothesis. And so you then evaluate that null hypothesis and make a decision to reject it or to fail to reject it. And just the language of that often seems very definitive. Um, and I believe that's part of why uh, replications in fields that really lean on testing are so woefully rare. But there is another approach to statistical inference uh, Jeff has playfully called it the new statistics um, because it's new to many dinosaurs like myself who are only trained in the testing approach um, with estimation being an afterthought, but it's actually the older tradition in statistical uh, inference. And in this approach, we don't ask a qualitative question, we ask a quantitative question. Not does the drug work, but how well does the drug work? Uh, how much might early childhood education impact IQ? And so we answer that with an effect size and a confidence interval or a credible interval that focuses on our uncertainty and that draws our attention to what the range of possibilities might be and the practical significance of our finding. And because this approach really highlights uh, uncertainty, I believe that it really encourages the idea that no one study strands on its own, that we need replication and synthesis through meta-analysis. Testing is really just a special case, a special application of estimation. And I believe that's part of why it just makes more sense to use that as our starting point. It's easier to teach, students have more fun understanding and learning estimation, that leads to better statistical inference, and I believe to better science in the end. So what I want to do is demonstrate that a little bit, show some statistical problems that arise with testing approach and how estimation might overcome them, and interleave with that kind of uh, persuasive thing, I want to just demo a couple of tools that I think that can make um, this transition easier. And Fiona, you're going to have to definitely jump in. I, I think I'm going to be like 15.2 minutes, you know, so make sure you cut me off. Um, to show you 
uh, good statistical inference, I need to also show you some bad. And what I want to focus on is this field uh, that was really hip and popular a few years ago, intranasal oxytocin social behavior. It started in 2005 with a paper published in Nature that has now been cited over 3,000 times. And in this study, they administered the neurohormone oxytocin to human participants with a little spray squirt up the nose. People either got oxytocin or placebo and then played an economics game where they had to trust each other. And the study reported that give, being given this drug, this oxytocin, increased trust, made people more trusting. And this study uh, launched 1,000 ships, as well as well over 100, uh, 200 clinical trials in the U.S. alone. Suddenly, oxytocin could do everything. It could change your attractability. It could change your paternal relationships. It could uh, modify your trustworthiness. It could change how you interacted with others. Uh, you name it. Uh, there was a study out there that said that intranasal oxytocin could do it. And it got into the media. You can buy oxytocin spray online. A lot of people believe that you could use oxytocin to treat symptoms of autism. There's a whole industry that has now grown up around this very large empirical literature, all peer reviewed and published. But, but, and there's always a but in meta science, right? Uh, replications by the same team that published the Nature Auth uh, paper with a much larger sample show little to no effect of oxytocin on trust. And a meta analysis conducted by some of the key players in the field found that there was just egregiously low sample sizes and yet an unbelievable level of significant results that the whole literature was actually statistically implausible. And some brave researchers actually unveiled their file drawer, uh, revealed that what they had managed to publish of this literature was a very small fraction of all the studies they had done and that looking at the balance of the evidence showed no effect. And I think if you're at Amos, you've probably encountered uh, stories like this where big fields kind of suddenly look really shaky I think what is um, very interesting about this particular field is this kicker, that recent research has shown that oxytocin administered through the nose probably does not cross the blood-brain barrier with sufficient concentrations to affect behavior within the hour time frame that it was usually being tested. In other words, it was like they were giving both groups placebos. This is a literally inert uh, manipulation, and none of the research findings could possibly be true. Uh, these are this is a true null that people have been studying. Uh, this whole literature, a very large literature, millions of dollars spent, is probably an evidence mirage, basically scientists playing Ouija board with each other. Now, if you're into meta science, you probably have your own preferred explanations of why, the perverse incentives that can occur in science, publication bias. But I believe uh, it's pretty straightforward that a big piece of this was well-meaning, smart people making really bad inferences from their statistics. So I want to show you some of that in the very first paper, that nature paper, and show you how an estimation approach might have helped. So we go back to the first paper. They use this testing approach. So they ask this qualitative question, does oxytocin affect trust? Some people got a squirt of oxytocin, some got a placebo. They played the trust game. And here's the bar graph they made of the average amount invested with each other, which they use as a measure of trust. You can see that in this sample, oxytocin participants did invest more. This was statistically significant, P is 0.03, one-tailed. What I want to draw your attention to is the conclusion. Later in the short paper, they just state unequivocally, here we show that oxytocin causes a substantial increase in trust amongst humans. The title was Oxytocin Increases Trust Amongst Humans. Full stop. No qualifications, no call for replication, nothing. No reviewers question that, and in 3,000 citations, very few have been critical about the level of quality of evidence, whether it matches the claims made. It was this nearly instant transformation of one statistically significant finding into something that's demonstrated or settled science. I know that we harp on this idea that statistical significance does not imply practical significance, but that really undercut sells the depth of the problem here. It's not just that they're claiming practical significance, it's that they're making claims that make it seem like this is fully settled. And that discourages the need for replication. It makes people who get negative results think it must be them. This is a really egregiously wrong interpretation, of this very tenuous data. And we could have seen that if we had expressed this from the get-go in estimation terms. So I'm going to use a tool uh, called ESCII. ESCII was originally developed by Jeff. It was developed in Excel. We have a new module that is available in Jamovi, which is a free open source statistical software, which is just such a pleasure to use. We'll hopefully have something in Jasp soon. Um, this is what Jamovi looks like, and it has this really cool uh, module system that lets you have some stuff out of the box, but then 
bunch of different people have contributed modules that add functions. Here, I'm going to very quickly go down and install ESCII. It takes a moment, and as soon as it's installed, you get a new menu, and that menu lets you commit, create estimates with confidence intervals for most of the designs that you would encounter your first two semesters of statistics. A little screen shake there, but I'm loading the original data from Kostfeld et al. Uh, they published a histogram where I was able to recover their actual data. And now I'm just going to do a comparison of the two groups to look at the difference in their mean investments between the oxytocin and the placebo group. I'm going to use a 90% confidence interval to match the incredible stringency of their one-tailed test. Uh, this is just going to give you a quick idea of what this looks like, how to go through it. Now let me bring you back to the world of the slides. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace their analysis with this estimation approach. Rather than ask their qualitative question, we'd ask a quantitative question. How much might oxytocin affect trust? Rather than their tired bar graph, use a modern uh, data visualization that shows us all the data, shows us the mean for the placebo group with its confidence interval, the mean for the oxytocin group with its confidence interval. Most importantly, this visualization tries to visualize the effect size of interest, what we really care about, which is the difference between the two groups. We consider the placebo group to be normal, then we see that the uh, in this sample, the oxytocin group invested about a buck 41 more. We represent that difference with this little delta for difference. And we visualize the range of expected sampling error with this little cat's eye. And we see that the 90% confidence interval covers 90% of the area. So we can express this finding as an estimated effect with a range of uncertainty around that effect. And when we do that, we can see that this data is compatible with a very wide range of effect sizes infinitesimal to small to moderate to large, right? One way I like to show this is think about this is what would the power be if you needed to replicate this? What, sorry, what sample size would you need to try to replicate this result with 80% power? And the answer here would be somewhere between 9,800 people per group and 20 per group. But we can see here why this is not settled science, right? The original motto of the Royal Society was et nullius verbum, take no one's word for it, see for yourself. You have established a scientific effect when you can tell someone else how to see it for themselves. And you can tell them, here's what you would do to see this in your own lab or in your own research. Here, this research does not provide any guidance of how someone would try to see the same result. We have no idea what sample size we'd need to do to see an effect of oxytocin on trust. Expressed in this way, no one would really make this mistake of uh, overclaiming such unequivocal confidence about this result. I showed you how you could do this in uh, ESCII really quickly. You can also do this in R. There's a new package out called StatPsych, uh, developed by Doug Monet. It's on CRAN. You can install it in R. It covers a really wide range of effect sizes, parametric, non-parametric, simple and complex designs, and the functions are all well vetted and well referenced. I've got a link uh, on my resource page that shows you how you can use it to analyze this data. Let me show you another example of bad inference. Here, not only did the original researchers ask if oxytocin might influence trust, they also asked if that effect would be specific. So they did the same experiment with additional group of participants who played a risk game. It was the same investment game, but played with a computer, so it didn't involve human interaction, just what they called risk rather than trust. What they found, you can see here, there was no statistically significant difference, but that became in the discussion the claim that oxytocin does not increase risk level. That is, as we all, all the hipsters know, embracing the null, the fallacy of, a, of endorsing the null, taking a non-significant finding that mean no effect. And we do this, or we see this in literature often, when it's convenient. If we were to express this in estimation terms, nobody would make this mistake. If we look at the estimated effect size, we can see that in the sample, yes, it's zero, but that the effect sizes in the confidence interval are consistent with a really wide range, that this is not enough data show the negligible effect. This is only enough data to say, I don't know, maybe. I want to, I like this example in part because it also points out some ways in which when people are trained in testing, they're often trained in a way that leads to a really strong confirmation bias. At least this is how I was taught. I was taught that you give a point null and then you look to see if your result is statistically significant. And if it is, you get to celebrate. But if it's not, that's a negative result and we don't have to think about it that it's meaningless or it's uninterpretable or it's not publishable or it's probably your fault. And that this doesn't mean that you reject, embrace the null, it just means nothing, you fail to reject it. And I was never taught a procedure by which I could prove myself wrong. And it should make sense that that's just teaching out of a 
tails I win, heads you lose mentality for doing science, a way that's not actually scientific at all. We aren't teaching a testing procedure in which you can be proven wrong. We're not really doing fair testing. A fair testing procedure can be done with null hypothesis testing. What we do is we have an interval null, and then we do equivalence and non-equivalence testing. If our whole effect with this confidence interval is outside of the interval null, we've now demonstrated evidence that it's a meaningful effect. If the hole is inside, we've demonstrated evidence that it might be negligible. And if it crosses the border, it's a maybe. That's a fair testing procedure, one that can give a yes, no, or maybe. We ought to be teaching that to our students, but it's really difficult given the difficulties of even just understanding one p-value, let alone the five p-values that this procedure produces. But if our students learn testing first, this is, e I'm sorry, estimation first, this is easy. This is just looking at a picture and judging by eye if we have a clearly negligible, clearly meaningful, or indeterminate case. All right, I have another little example about interactions and how badly they're uh, analyzed and how much easier they're with estimation. I knew we weren't going to get into it, so I'll just leave this. This debacle of oxytocin and social trust is one of several really egregious failings of recent science, and it's one that should really give you upset. The number of parents with children with autism who got excited about this, the number of clinical trials launched, the number of side effects produced by those clinical trials, it, it staggers the mind, the amount of money wasted on mining noise. It's clear that part of this reason is due to just really poor statistical inference. And I think that if we took an estimation first approach, it would be a lot easier to avoid some of these clunker ideas and some of these really bad inferences. Confidence intervals help us really think about uncertainty at the forefront. They help uh, those who do want to use testing uh, develop a procedure that's more fair, and they help us do better when we're faced with complex designs where a lot of life scientists fall down. Why do, is the estimation so magical to my mind? It's really about an attentional shift, right? Testing is all about if we can rule out a null hypothesis. Estimation is about what remains compatible models that would still regularly generate the types of data that we just observed. Testing is kind of like really focusing on the one witness who's been exonerated. What we should be thinking about as police detectives is who's left in the lineup. That's what informs our theory. That's what informs the design of our next study. Estimation gives us that attentional shift that can really lead us to better. And here's a bunch of resources you need to get to it. How'd I do? 16 minutes, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, thanks so much. That's great. Um, and Bob's given us a link to his slides in the chat if anyone wants to catch up on the ones that he um, skipped through them. Our next presenter is Lee, and I'm a little bit scared by the title of this talk. It's not as simple as it seems. It never seemed simple to me. Um, so if it's even harder than that, then I think I'm in trouble. Um, thanks, Lee. I would like to start with the acknowledgement to country. I acknowledge the Turrbal and Yuggera people as the First Nation owners of the land. Um, I pay respect to, I recognize, I pay respect to their elders, laws, customs and creation spirits. I recognize that these lands have always been places of teaching and learning and I extend my respect to all those First Nations people that are here today. Today I'm going to talk about a topic that I am passionate about, which is improving statistical education by understanding common mistakes and misconceptions made by health researchers. And although this is um, based, this research is based in health, it really is pretty much transferable to most fields. So there is evidence to suggest that poor statistical quality amongst researchers is endemic, with an estimated 85% of research being avoidably wasted. And this is through poor study design, poor modeling and poor reporting, with many people authors suggesting there's a reproducibility crisis. While many people argue that the causes of this, as in publish to perish, where researchers are um, getting funding and there's a 
quantity over quality of research papers being produced, it is widely acknowledged that lack of training contributes to all aspects of um, poor practice. So this is a broader part of my PhD and um, I, I was interested in studying this research because what I realised is, as a consulting statistician, I realised that most students are learning statistics in a highly compartmentalised way. They don't um, often un understand the linking between statistical test and the overall theory. Um, and I think this is really important that we understand what they get out of their first year statistic courses and coming down the pipeline, how they're reporting this. So we can gain a lot of understanding by exploring their, um, what they're reporting and their statistical understanding through their papers. I'm hoping that this will be able to provide recommendations for improving statistical education and reporting statistics. Now, the first part of my PhD is looking at um, reviewing 100 randomly selected papers from PLUS One. Um, it's in health and I have focused on linear regression. The reason for focusing on linear regression was that it is important concepts that goes right through the statistical area. Now, I'm really excited about this because it has taken me 12 months to recruit the 40 statisticians and I've just finished recruiting last month. So today I'm not going to give you the full on results, but I'm going to give you a qualitative overview of what I've found. And hopefully it's a, I'm going to present not a statistical lecture, but it's going to be a bit more light. So the um, some of the questions that I asked uh, in the statistician to review was about statistical assumptions. Um, I asked them, did the authors look at statistical assumptions and how did they check assumptions? Other questions I asked about scientific interpretation, um, how were the coefficients uh, interpreted, really? So you ask, why do assumptions and in interpretation matter? Actually, we've had a huge lesson, or the public has a, had a huge lesson on um, why it matters that, that drugs are, have proper statistical analysis and they're interpreted properly with COVID. So we've had an armchair view of the good, the bad and the ugly of, of statistics with COVID where we have had some drugs being pushed um, even though they weren't effective into the market. So it's really important that people um, interpret the results very well. Now, I think what's interesting in the COVID situation compared to what actually happens in normal practice is there's been a ginormous amount of funding and scientists spending their own time actually um, investigating poor statistics and calling people out. And I think this is a healthy thing. The public needs to understand that you can't just do one study and that's it. So um, in, nor in the normal statistics, we publish millions of papers a year. So many papers are published and never really challenged. So it is important that the average researcher has better statistical literacy. Now, as a consulting statistician, the, our bugbear and what we saw in, when we're reviewing these papers is people come to me and say, I know something should be normally distributed, I'm just not sure what. So what you find is, and in the papers, generally there's a statement saying that uh, my, all the data was normally distributed or all the continuous data was normally distributed and they don't necessarily uh, describe what they checked or how. Now there's a huge myth um, among this it's because people think that the y variable needs to be checked for normal distribution. 
So this is only actually true in a one sample t-test. So even in, in t-test, this is, uh, is, is a problem because the actual assumption in a t-test is that two groups, um, that each group in a two sample t-test, each group needs to be checked for normality. Now, if you think about how we learn statistics in general, we uh, have taught them, here's descriptive statistics, we need to check for normality to, to see how it's described. Um, then we say, here's a one sample test we need to check for normality, a two sample test, a one way ANOVA. So we, we do about, we do 10 tests and teach them the normality every time. So it's probably not surprising that the only constant thing that they've gotten is something needs to be checked for normality. Now I'm going to just give you a brief overview. Don't be too scared. I'm just going to give you a, a quick reminder of what a residual is so that you follow along with what I'm saying. So here we have a, an example where I'm looking at weight um, and height. So the slope represents the average change in weight where, with a unit change in age. And I just want to remind you that a residual is actually, um, if we think we have 30 people and we've measured their um, weight and age, and if I observe someone who is 55 years old, um, they were 75 kilos. But actually, the model predicted this person to be 70 kilos. So actually, the residual is simply the difference between the observed and the predicted value. So the residual here would be five. So what we are expecting is we have some small residuals, some large residuals, some residuals in between. But overall, we expect these residuals to be normally distributed. Now, I'm not going to give a lecture about the assumptions of um, linear regression. I'm just going to say that it's actually the residuals that need to be checked for independence, normality, linearity, and homoscedasticity. So what we're saying here is that the standardized residuals should have a mean of zero. There should be no definable patterns. The number of, um, there should be, the number of observations should be as many as above and below the line. So unfortunately, the second um, misconception is related to the first and the, that normality is the only assumption that matters. In our, um, our work, we have generally found what happens is only one third of people is checking any assumption. So that's a big problem. Um, and sometimes people say, oh, this is because there's no space, but this was done in plus one where there's no word limits. So that's a bit of an excuse, I think. When people uh, checked assumptions, a large proportion only checked normality. So the problem with this is normality is probably the least important assumption. Um, there's some robustness to normality violations and it's easily it's easily remedied by bootstrapping most of the time so of the very small proportion of people who uh, actually checks normality or any other um, assumption only like three or four papers checked um, the residuals so they're not there's only a very small proportion in general checking assumptions, but most people are not actually correctly checking assumptions. So another pervasive misconception is outliers should be removed. This is very pervasive because it is in some textbooks, it's incorrect and it many people, even when they, the experience of reviewing these, these things were, was that um, when they do actually talk about outliers, which is not very often, most people do not mention outliers, um, they often cite textbooks when they 
they remove it. So it, that's very interesting circle. So thinking about our first presentation. So this is removing outliers can also be unintentional poor practice as it leads back to the uh, belief that everything needs to be normal. So that seems to be the driving force behind what people are doing. This is also a questionable research practice because um, you can remove outliers to make things look a little bit better for your treatment. So it's very important that people deal with um, outliers very um, transparently. And unfortunately, the whole is this an outlier or an influential point is very few people are actually getting to that sort of sophistication in their, um, their publication. So another misconception that is interesting is that often the uh, assumption should not be viewed in, well, so they, assumptions should be viewed in isolation. No, they shouldn't be, because often what happens is um, other uh, violations might be related. So nonlinearity might be the cause of the normality issue. So if you don't understand this, you've done some sort of transformation or um, other things that don't quite really fit what you're doing. So understanding and plotting your data is essential. So this is the interesting thing because um, bootstrapping would be a fix for normality. But if it, there's a non-linearity problem, that won't fix the non-linearity problem. So it's very important we understand what relationships are going on within our data. So the p-value, so the last presenter really described well the problems with p-values. And this is about p-hacking and the emphasis on significant results rather than the original question. Um, it's important that we realise that we should be interpreting effect sizes and scientific importance rather than um, p-values. So like more than half of papers still that we, um, we reviewed just made their um, conclusion on the dichotomization of the p-value rather than talking about was this scientifically important. So by far the overall and the last misconception I'm going to talk about, and I think probably the most important one, is t-tests and ANOVA regression are completely unrelated tests. We need to start teaching everything is a regression. So I think about how we teach other forms of regression, like linear regression, We've we taught, teach linear regression, we teach logistic regression. Linear regression is the only one where we say, oh, the in, when the independent variable is categorical, we do this, and when it's continuous, we do that. We don't teach that anywhere else. And names are names. So you can say a uh, one group T test, a two group T test, a one way ANOVA, a factorial ANOVA, ANCOVA. There's 50 different tests in there, but actually they're all relating to a general linear model, which can be seen as a unifying variation. So the important part about this is we should focus less on the actual. Um, the individual tests and more on the combined statistical theory. So I just want to, uh, what, what can we do? We can teach more in a linear model framework. We can teach statistical thinking. And I think it's really important. And what the previous uh, speakers were saying is um, textbooks and who is teaching you to stats is very, very important. What we find in the health fields is often statisticians are not actually the ones teaching you statistics. It might be a clinician. I think there are reporting guidelines out there, but they're not very well used. I think through my experience, um, students are always hungry for uh, Templar examples going through how to do this, not just this is what you do, but here's a researched example and here's how to present that. I would also encourage reproducibility. 
But what, uh, just a quick note on that, you can reproduce garbage just as well as you can reproduce uh, good statistics. So it's interpretation that matters. Thank you. Thanks, Lee. Um, I, okay, we have um, some time now for quest general questions. Um, and then we'll move into our breakout rooms in, I don't know, about another 10 minutes or we'll see how we go. Um, so I'll, I have a question um, for, well, mostly for Bob really, that I'll start while the rest of you get your questions into chat or formulate them and I can unmute you. So Bob, you said a few times things like, no one would make this mistake if, or no one would misinterpret this if, um, that they seem like empirical claims. What the, what's your evidence? I don't have any. Yep, it's a it's a wish and a hope. And I and I have to say, I think actually there's some pretty good evidence that they actually, that people do, uh, that people do report confidence intervals and just ignore them and move on. So yeah, I guess um, my my hope. My belief, and it is a belief at this point, is it when you, I, I believe that it's a symptom of people learning p-values first as a kind of their first language. It's the way it's taught. And then confidence intervals and estimation is always like, you know, back of each chapter, a few moments. I think if we flip that around and people thought in terms of estimates first um, and testing is to be something used only when you have a clear real hypothesis, just one tool to be used in certain cases. I do think that these errors would be reduced, but you're right. It's an empirical claim and one actually where the evidence is more against me at this point for me, um, which is depressing, too depressing to, to talk about further. Okay, I, th I can see Jeff has a question. Can we ask Jeff to, can you unmute yourself, Jeff? You should be able to now. Okay. Good morning, all. Uh, nice job, Bob. And um, uh, thanks everyone for tuning in. When I, I wrote my first book on the new statistics back in 2012, I really tried hard to make it a <coughs> space statistics textbook. And I had little boxes and reported some studies of statistical cognition and things were being stretched because they weren't replicated and wasn't all enormously clear and so on. I love the discipline, the research field of statistical cognition to flourish. And it seems to me it could be an extremely good, um, uh, good sort of career move for lots of, um, oh, there I am. Ah, yes, hi. Um, it could be a really good career move for lots of people who have to teach statistics because instead of having to make their mark as a social psychologist or developmental psychologist or whatever and publish their papers, they can actually do it in their field of interest of statistics and statistics education and publish um, hopefully high quality cognitive psychology studies that would really guide the future generations of textbooks. And I would love to see a uh, intro stats textbook where the major arguments were backed up with evidence that people do understand it better, do communicate better, do interpret the recommended graphs uh, with um, uh, greater accuracy. But I'm a bit more positive perhaps than Bob finished up by saying, there's a hell of a lot of um, anecdotal, but on the ground in the classroom feedback from teachers that teaching estimation first, as he so strongly uh, recommended, is actually more fun, it's more interesting. And students come up and say, yeah, hmm? yep, got it. What are you making a big deal about? And so if we can document that and pin it down and do it in a good replicated open science way, that would be fabulous. There's the challenge for the next generation and the one after. Um, do any of our speakers, panelists have questions for each other? Like, I want to know if you've sent any of these emails yet. 
and I want to know what kind of responses you're getting from uh, dear author, you're doing it wrong, emails. Yeah, I haven't sent them yet. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not quite sure how to write them. When I was yeah. initially doing this, I was, I was going to name and shame. Uh, it was my intention. And then I started thinking, well, what's the better way to actually get a good result? Yeah, so do I have to face this too because my the my the pub what I'm just about to publish is uh, talking about mistakes, and so I'm going to have to deal with a hundred people's papers. Um, some big. I found some really large errors. Um, so there's a couple of errors I note that I'll have to talk to Plus One about. <laughs> um, but. I think I'm probably going to do it in a less confrontational way and a more here's some improvement <laughs> it could be <laughs> within. Since they're recording the session, you both have to lock in your predictions right now. How many people do you think will respond? And out of those, how many do you think will actually make positive changes? <laughs> Very wise? small amount. I would hope a large amount, but I'm expecting a small amount. In fact, I was wanting, uh, after this, I was going to think about following up. Yeah. I mean, in my case, it's, it might be a little easier because the authors are likely to have other additions and so they, they have greater capacity to make those changes themselves. So I was actually, I mean, one of the reasons I haven't done this was I was proposing to say, you could write it like this and give them the text that could replace what they've written. And in that case, I think that's more likely to be useful, you know, be well received. Um, yes, well, uh, actually, that's the full term of my project. I intend to replicate their analyses. So yeah. the idea is that I will be giving them a PDF with what they should have done. <laughs> yeah. um, I'd, I'd like to put in a prediction of how many um, responses you get along the lines of, yes, yes, we know it's not technically correct. We're just trying to simplify it for students. Yes. <laughs> I, yeah. my, predi my prediction is 17. <laughs> um, uh, we'll see. Um, there's a question from Taya. Can you, are you unmuted? That? There you are. I am. Thanks, Fiona. And thanks for a great session, everyone. I wondered um, who the speakers think needs to make the first move here, because the, clearly the system is working quite well um, for some academics. They're able to hit all their publication metrics and uh, until Lee turns up in their inbox, no one's <laughs> getting too agitated. Like conscientious statistical practice is very expensive and we have a shortage of qualified statisticians. So I'm wondering who, who do you think needs to take that step um, to get some change? Nick, do you want to start? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, you know, I see problems in all the students, undergraduate students, well, not all of them, but most of the undergraduate students I encounter have misinterpretations um, and confusion. It's, not, it's more just confusion rather than misinterpretation. Um, fixing that, I think, is really difficult because, you know, it's this miscon these misconceptions are pervasive through the discipline. So, yeah, I don't have a, I don't know where to start. I think we've really got to hit everything. We've got to hit, you know, try and influence the undergraduates by fixing the textbooks. We've got to be trying to educate our colleagues better, uh, educate our journal reviewers and editors better. I don't know. I mean, the fact that Lee's found all these basic errors in linear regression in journal articles suggests we've got major problems. So in the disciplines, I think everywhere at once. Um, Leigh, do you want to respond to Taya's question? And I don't know if you've seen the question from Matt in the chat as well. Maybe you can give us give us your thoughts on all of that at once. So I think it needs to have a pronged effect. We're not going to fix it overnight. It's taken a generation or two generations to uh, go through. So you've got a lot of people in, say, for instance, biology areas, the lab people doing specific things and they they always say, oh, I'm just doing t-tests, <laughs> whether it's appropriate or not. So there's, there's really cement thinking in some areas. But 
arguably, I would say a lot of the students I come in contact, uh, contact with are trying really hard. And actually, the research that I, I see, um, the, the 100 papers that I checked, I can see that probably over time, more people are actually trying to check normality, they're just doing it wrong. So they are responding to uh, reviewers um, and the journal requirements. So I think journal requirements need to be um, changed because that is where you can actually affect change. The biggest problem I feel in the review is no one's checking for scientific importance. So reviewers need to be trained better and that's where we could have one approach and I think the change is already happening. Like if you talk to biased statisticians, everyone's had this talk I gave, it's talking to the converted. Everyone's pretty much on board with we should be teaching general linear models and overall statistical um, theory rather than just here's a, here's a t-test basically. So the question, does Matt want to ask me the question or do you want me to read it? Um, where are you, Matt? Can you raise your hand? There you are. Yep. Hey, I'm here. Yes, yeah, so I was just kind of wondering, like, thinking about how research is so predominantly focused on assumptions that um, aren't real assumptions, like normality of predictors or the dependent variable, or they focus on assumptions that um, are real, like normality of errors, but don't really matter in terms of producing unbiased and consistent estimates. Um, and Assumption checking also has side effects, right? People can end up by in the effort of trying to look at assumptions, look at alternative analyses and end up kind of going down the garden of forking parts, maybe doing some selective reporting. So like to look at it cynically, do you ever kind of think that what people do at the moment is on average actually making it worse than just not checking assumptions at all? Yeah, kind of. And that was a really interesting that was point was brought to me where there's a lot of people doing <laughs> it's really funny when you read the paper there's a lot of people doing non-parametric t-tests and then all of a sudden regression shows up where they're, they're not <laughs> they, they haven't even met, thought about when they're in a t-test um, arena they think oh i must check normality and then you hit a, a regression and they've forgotten that normality exists and they're just doing it anyway and i'm going hang on uh, you you didn't need to do a non-parametric uh, t-test in the first place because the, you're interpreting normality like it needs to be exact normality. It's not really that important. So I guess the thing is to teach um, statistics the way statisticians uh, actually view assumptions. We don't go, oh, it's it's fails. It's exa it's not exactly normal. We say, well. It's not exactly normal, but it's not really impinging on the test. So I think it's the whole approach. There's no, and that's what I'm probably trying to say. Yes, I, I think we need to probably take p-values away. I don't think we should be take, putting p-values at the start of the course. I think we should be teaching the estimation and p-values are can be an important place, but they're really bad when they're used to as the only interpretation. Um, and we just need to increase that. You can't get away with not um, interpreting the effect size. I think that's something reviewers could do. Uh, and if we put pressure on reviewers, they could be trained to um, do effect sizes. I don't think it's that hard. It just needs time. And I have plus one has put recently uh, put better guidelines into place for statistics and we'll see if that makes a difference. So it's all about trying to measure these. I think the problem is everyone's realised it's bad, but no one's actually spent the time to see what actually works in an empirical manner at the moment. Yep. Um, what we're going to do now, we've got about 15 minutes and um, Rose is standing by to hit the button to join a breakout room. So choose your breakout room. You can, um, our speakers will be um, in their own rooms. So um, go in there and ask them all your hard questions. Thanks for coming to this session. I really hope that we can 
continue some conversations about statistics education uh, as part of our broader conversations about meta research. I am, um, as I as I said at the start, I am concerned that it's kind of dropped off the radar a little bit in recent years, and um, it's such an important topic, and there's such interesting work being done in this area that it's um, really important that we make sure that it gets time in our programs and thoughts. So thanks for coming and thank you very, very much to Mick, Bob and Lee for your excellent talks and for the discussion afterwards. And um, see you at the rest of the conference. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Have a good one. Have a great conference, everyone.